Hey everybody, welcome back to Great Mondays Radio. Um, today I have on uh, a incredible human being. His name is Corey Rosen, and he is an author um, and a, a, a power storyteller. He's the host of the Bay Area version of The Moth, uh, which is the Moth Radio Hour, which is a storyteller uh platform that a lot of folks know and love um and he's a strategic consultant helping organizations uh find and tell their story so Corey rosen um is uh he is here to help us understand how to better tell sticky stories so, Corey, thanks for coming on Great Mondays Radio. Josh, thank you for having me. It's a it's a long time aspiration of mine to be on the Great Mondays podcast. It's, it's so crazy because it was a great. It's a long time aspiration for you to be on the pod for me to have you on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So it lined up. It worked. This is a great culmination, uh, personally and professionally. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, Corey, uh, I I want to start by sort of like um setting us up let's 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 explore or at least talk a little bit about why 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 should why would i have some uh, uh, someone who is a professional storyteller on a program about company culture what do those things have in common why what is the relevance here that's a great question i mean when we think about culture and we think about the cultures of our companies they are rooted in something, right? They're rooted in our values. They're rooted in our sort of internal um, motivations that make us drive and build the companies that we want to work with and for and create the services and the products that we want to put out into the world. And that's all amazing and important, but it would be nothing without the stories that we tell about them. The values and the beliefs, the the uh, ways that we live are understood by other stories that we tell about them, either the origin stories of how they came to be, the struggle stories to uh, overcome obstacles and, and difficulties to get to successes, or the, or the future focusing stories about this is the company that we, we want to be. This is the, the, the vision of ourselves in the, in the future. Um, I like to look at everything through the prism of a story of how might we tell this situation as a story because of the amazing impact that story telling has on communications between one-on-one yeah. -on -one and large groups of people. So, so that's kind of my overall thing is just focusing the communications that we have, whether that be company internal communications, externally focused communications, sales, marketing, what have you, through the lens of the stories that we tell. One of the, the I, I feel like there's two different kinds of stories when we're thinking about, I don't know, just being a human, but also being a human inside of an organization, there's the story that we tell others mm -hmm. that you just described, but there's also, also the story that we tell ourselves. And I, and having done this kind of culture work for a long time, it, to me, it's like the first place we have to start is the story that, and we can either say, tell ourselves individually, but tell ourselves as an organization almost there's kind of this duality of like i have to understand it for myself before i before i can communicate it with somebody else mm -hmm. are the principles across like is this is it is it, the, is it a similar activity is it a similar benefit like the one that the, like i have to go through this exercise of figuring out what my the story is i understand before i tell it to somebody else are those the the same principles they're the same kinds of stories or is there something that is different between those two that's a good question so do you mean when you're talking about the stories that we tell ourselves as a company are you talking about like what's our what's our mission like what's our purpose like that story or do you mean well, like, I mean, I, I think it's for? part of, I think the mission or, or the purpose, or I think that's, those are elements of that story, but, but it's like, how do we understand? And I think it could work in, you know, sort of <laughs> fractal nature. It's, you know, how do I understand who I am? 
And it's the same question we have to ask about an organization ourselves before we can start going out, go out and expressing that to the world. I think the difference for me with those with those factors is that there is the there is things like a mission or or the thing that we're going out to do, but a story is much more personal than that. Um, mm. A story is about a situation, a time when a thing happened, and how that thing led to some sort of change. So big ideas inside of companies, whether that be the why we exist or the what we exist for or where we are going can be said in very general terms that can be very forgettable. So you can take that same idea, but you can mm. nut nutshell that into the time that this thing happened. And because of that, I decided, or we decided, or we discovered that our purpose was to be this. And that kind of a story version of that same idea is something that somebody can have their aha and their connection with you and say, you are who I want to work with. You are a company I want to support and endorse because not just that you say that you do these things, but you have the the example, the narrative yeah. kind of a, a underbelly that that justifies where you got. So, okay. So, so let's get into then what makes a sticky story. What makes a really great story? So the first thing that I'm hearing you say yeah. is- it's it has to be specific. It has to be about a particular moment or instance. Yep. Yeah. Something I love to tell people that are developing stories, either for themselves or for others, is um, a, a very core reminder that every story shouldn't be every story. So what I mean by that is that we have this tendency to say this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And you're just kind of going on and on about yeah, yeah. when we started and then we had this problem, but then we reinvented ourselves as this. And then we hired this person. And it's like, wait, you're just telling me a list of your yes. timeline. Yeah, you want to of... include it. I mean, that's yes. look, this is, a, I think, a very human problem. We want to yeah. include everything. Yeah. Yeah. How so you, as as storytellers, just... our goal is to simplify. Like, let's boil it down to this is a story about about the day that I um, maybe it's a personal story. The day I joined the company, um, what I was looking for, what I needed and why I joined this company. So if this is like a personal um, story about the fulfillment that you got from this service, this product, this mm -hmm. uh, this object. Um let, um, let me tell you a story. I'll tell you a personal story. So I could, I was, I was hoping we would, I was hoping <laughs> we would get one at least. Uh, yeah. At least. So, um, <laughs> so I guess here's, here's a, you know, personal, a personal mission of mine. So when I was young, I uh, envisioned working in entertainment, you know, working in television, film, theater, something like that. I was always very interested in, in, in that world. And I was really taken by the, the um, kinds of, media that I was consuming myself. So my aspiration wasn't just to work in media, but to work it for a company that I admired, that I liked. And so I made this list, this super list of every company that I would ever want to work for in my career. So I just made this giant list and I started going out to them to see if they would be interested in hiring somebody like me. The problem is, is I had no experience. I had no actual tangible, like, job work experience. The only real like job jobs that I'd had were either like, you know, odd jobs, mowing lawns, raking leaves. I was something called a rent a kid in my <laughs> community where I grew up, which was a real thing that you can get a work permit and some guy would hire a bunch of kids to clean his attic. I don't know that that would fly today. Anyway, I <laughs> had, I had that. And I also had, um, that I was, a, you know, whatever, a cashier at Burger King. That was my job experience. So why was, you know, Comedy Central or Jim Henson Productions or MTV, all the companies I was like applying for back in, you know, the 90s to work for. So I discovered that, you know, a resume itself is a kind of creative act. You know, sure, it's a it's a listing of, of what you've done, but it's also the story that you tell about those things. And so I took some swings on my first resume Instead of writing Burger King, for example, as the company that I worked for, I, I said, well, I didn't get a check from Burger King. I got a check from from the Kessler Group, a restaurateur in my hometown. And 
I changed my title because I would say welcome to Burger King. So I said I was a public relations associate. <laughs> seemed fitting. And then I just kind of went from there. I described all of the things that I did as, as implementing, you know, uh, uh, implementing uh, um, sales increase, whatever. I, I, I fluffed up my resume for things like asking, would you like a large Coke instead of a small Coke? And, and when I finally got the job interview at all of these big companies, I'm sitting in New York City in these big offices of these legendary companies. And as I sat down behind the desk of each of these companies, I immediately said, I have to tell you something. And I owned up to the resume that got me in the door because I didn't want to be caught in my lie. And I explained to each of these people the, the fiction that I had spun on the resume. And to every single one of them said, when can you start? <laughs> so I look at, I look at, you know, my own sort of like journey into a creative, <laughs> creative uh, realm. And uh, I guess as a storyteller yeah. through that lens as like, I guess I've been doing it all along. I guess yeah. that I look at the kind of stories that we're saying to work at companies inside of the companies to justify the raise that we should get or whatever those things are can be best communicated through um, a narrative. So, okay. So, so a great story is, uh, uh, like you, you, you had uh, it's communicated this idea of a sticky story. So, yeah. so what makes for a sticky story or yeah. what is, what is a sticky story? Yeah. How is it better than non-sticky or unsticky stories? Why do yeah. I, why do I care about a sure. sticky story? Well, let's, I mean, let's go to the source. Let's talk about Dan and Chip Heath and made to stick and their, their definition of sticky stories has the success sort of matrix. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that works really well with brands. I think it also works really well with the stories that we tell inside of those brands. So let's just break them down. And I've also made a couple of little modifications, sorry, Dan, um, to this system, because I think that every sticky story should be simple. Like we talked about should be a uh, universal um, which is one variation I've made on their thing. Universality in terms of like everybody can understand it. Even if it's not your story, we can relate to that. It's got a universal connection, right? It's concrete. Like it's specific and detailed in its concreteness. Mm -hmm. It's credible, right? And credibility is always a very funny one to me because credibility can come in two different very important ways. C credibility could be from what you've said, like the details of what you said, the concreteness of your storytelling can make it credible, but also the way that you say your message mm -hmm. is how you convey credibility. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard plenty of people tell me something that is for, you know, as far as I know, a true story, but because they're so practiced in reciting this story that they're telling, it feels like a script and it doesn't feel real anymore. So there's a, uh, they got too of, good at it. They get so good at it when we are so good at pitching our product that it feels like we've just memorized a script and it's a performance. Mm -hmm. Then we feel a distance from that person. So credibility is a fickle thing because it comes from being real and having the, the bones to back it up, but yeah. it also comes from how we say it. So sometimes credibility can come by messing up, by being human and by being vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. We reveal our humanity and we go, oh, don't worry. I, the same thing happens to me all the time. That's great. Um, and then just finishing out the success yeah. is emotion. You know, we so often in our storytelling tell what happens and how it was, but we don't talk about the why, the heart of it, the how we were changed by it, how we were affected by it, the why I should care, um, that it be a story, you know, that it has an actual shape to it a beginning, middle, end. And then the last S of success, if you've tracked along with this, is surprise. Something either out of the ordinary, either a surprise that happens in the story that I'm surprised, or a surprise that happened to the storyteller that they were surprised in the telling. That mm -hmm. there is something out of the ordinary. If everything happens exactly the way you expected it to be, it's not a very interesting story. What? That's um, that's surprising to me. <laughs> that surprise is surprising. Yeah. I mean, when you think about a like he like uh, helping um, an organization tell yeah. a story, sure. I, I mean, I, I I'm just like usually. I, I guess I'm 
I'm thinking about the gap between what an organization usually says and you're saying, well, it's got to be very specific and concrete and also have this surprise. It, I'm, I'm kind of incredulous that an organization could could actually pull that off. Check off all those boxes. It feels yeah, like, like yeah, too especially many... that you're like, and then because it's like, or I feel like yeah. large organizations they want to project control and they want to project, you know, yeah. uh, you know, confidence and trust. Yeah. And and you know, surprise I think is doesn't have to be, but it can be often counterintuitive or counter sure. to that that idea. So yeah. I, I'm just wondering if do you have an example of a story that an organ that you that an organization has told you've helped an organization tell or you know you've heard doesn't have to yeah. be something that you actually did but it 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 made it worked in all of those capacities yeah um yeah i've i've worked for a lot of different companies and worked with a lot of different companies and you know crisis management is is the kind of situation where i could see this being a very real and needed um you know uh capacity you know a, t a skill or talent that the people inside the community need to uh understand and be able to communicate um dealing with layoffs dealing with downsizing dealing with you know large scale change in organizations can have huge and devastating impacts on the people that work there that have dedicated themselves that feel in some way part of that family um so here's a situation where there was an all hands meeting at a, at a company that I was working with and they had been through some really tough times. There were some slowdowns in work. There were some, you know, some sort of looming difficulties in the economic landscape of the company. And rather than communicating sort of what was coming next in an email or, you know, some kind of an all hands thing, they called everybody together into a conference room to lay out the situation. This is a, a company that works in the film, animation, visual effects space. And the owners of the company are a husband and wife team who uh, laid out for the company that there was a, a situation that they wanted to address. And it was just basically the health and future of the company. Um, Phil, who is you know one of the owners of the company, um, explained that his wife, Jules, the other, you know, the president of the company had made him get a haircut because um, he had to go to a meeting in Los Angeles to basically pitch on a movie project that, that they wanted to get some hope, you know, hopefully to get some work on. And he was feeling hopeless. He thought this is, there's no way we're going to get hired on this movie. It was the, the beginning of the new wave of Jurassic park movies, the Jurassic world franchise. And, um, you know, Phil had had some history with this. He had worked on some of the original movies, but now, you know, time had moved on. He had felt sort of uh, left behind by the industry in a sense. And he went into this meeting feeling defeated, but he looked good, at least because his wife told him to get a haircut. So he sits down in this meeting and in through the door comes a documentary crew to film the meeting that was happening. So he thought he was going in for a job interview effectively and they had called him in to offer him the job and to document it and make it part of the story of the movie that was happening what? so so in telling the company now coming back to like the meeting the setting of telling the company this you know we're all sitting there thinking that the bottom has dropped out that it's the worst thing that's going to happen but rather it's like we have lived another day the story that this this company has unfortunately had to tell over and over again is never give up. You know, there is no there is no die as long as you kind of live to to see another day. We're in it for the for the art for the passion. Yeah, and this is a company that's been around you know forty years now, and this is a radically difficult industry to stay involved in, but yet they've done this through sort of time and again discovering that by being who they are, they're able to get through to the next um, level of success. And I just really respected the way that they communicated that to the company by doing it in person by now granted this is happy news. So sure. That's right. an easier thing. It's a little bit well, the I mean, inverse of that. Yeah. But I've also experienced that too. I worked at a company 
that um, had to lay everybody off. They could not make payroll. And they called everybody into the, you know, to a conference room and explained it with tears in their eyes. So let's go back to those steps. Those like sticky success steps is the news was that the company is closing, right? The universal relatable thing is that we are just like you. We are just as disappointed as you are. We're not doing this to you. We are, we are, we are affected by the change. Mm -hmm. We are attached to the outcome of this change. So whether you're closing the whole company or you're closing a division of the company, being a human about it will affect the way that people are going to receive that news. Uh, well, it makes me think of the, there's been a raft of um, videos that uh, founders put up on LinkedIn and they're like rec either recording themselves laying people off or recording themselves after they've laid people off or whatever and like tears in their eyes and i've seen you know i i, I don't i didn't know what to think at first i still kind of don't but there's a lot of criticism around that like uh oh it's mm. another founder like and it and it feels i i think the response has been it's I don't know, inauthentic or, or something. I don't, I don't know, but it's like, I, I agree, but like what, what is different here? Why, why are people having, and maybe, maybe they're, it's not meant to be the world, right? Maybe you're not meant to put it out on social media, but it's like the, and I don't know how the employees took it, but I feel like they're trying to be authentic. Maybe, maybe they're not pulling it off or like, I don't know what, what is your assessment of them trying to be, or, or I don't know, put it out in the world. It just sounds- yeah, that's, that's an easy one. I think if it's performative in any sense, if it's performative one-on-one, -on -one, if you feel like I'm, even if it's just a meeting between yeah. us and yeah. it feels like I'm whipping up emotion to look sad, you're going to smell the lie yeah. and yeah. you're not going to believe it. Yeah. If you're pre presenting as sensitive on a social media platform to show the world how sad you are, then the world's going to call BS. Okay. If if you have a learning from that, if you're like, I'm a fan, founder of a company and I just had to go through my worst nightmare and I'm going to explain how I did it and why I did it and what I got from it or what I learned from it. And then it's a teaching to somebody else, not just a show of how woke and how sad and how whatever else I am, but if it's actually me passing on to other founders to other business leaders to other humans mm. that experience that i had that's sticky to me that's something that i want to hear and i want to know more about and i will maybe even hopefully respect you for having done that and to see the process that you went through um so that should i find myself in that situation i've learned from you you know that's why i think failure stories are so interesting and people like them because they we learn from the things that did not work. Um, we learn from things that did work too. But I think acting the part of the sad, you know, yeah, uh, business smell, leader smell is going to is going to feel fake. The, uh, great. I'm glad you yeah. said it's an easy <laughs> one because I was yeah. like, well, I don't know. They're doing exactly what you just said that they should do. Yeah, but it's but it's in the it's in the the veracity. It's in the credibility. Right. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, I, I, I look at other kinds of performing arts. I mean, let's look at like stand up comedy or sketch comedy, where like the concept that you're trying to present off is an illusion, right? Is yeah. that you're just thinking of these things, yeah. but you are doing the work you're practicing for it. So something that I would take from that for any kind of communicator is the sort of the storytelling uh, instinct that that one should always have for any of these kind of things, prepared remarks, company addresses, um, you know, maybe not press com. I don't know, like like certain certain kinds of of communications. There's the there's the script. There's the this is what I want to say. There's the talking points, and there's the presence of you giving that message. And I think that the magic happens in between those two things. There's that gray area between this is the message that I want to say, and this is what's happening right now as I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, where that credibility comes through, is that you've got to still be you. You've still got to be a person. 
And if you are walking up and reading from prepared remarks, no matter how heartfelt they might seem, you're going to feel a little robotic reading those remarks. You can write them to get them out of your system. And then I always recommend tell them, speak your story mm -hmm. because it will come out a little different. It will come out maybe not as good. Maybe other things will come out better because they will be true. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that the way that we communicate and think like a storyteller, which is like you're at a dinner party telling people a story over, you know, over the table, you're not going to read it from a prepared no, you no know, document or a, off your phone. You're going to tell them what happened. Yeah. So why? Okay. So so tell me if I'm I'm right here. So uh, I'm um, I'm a leader inside of an organization. I'm a manager. I'm leading a team. I'm the HR leader. Mm -hmm. The reason that I want to learn how to tell a good story is because of the impact that it'll have like the resonance like that people will going back to sticky will remember it as opposed to oh that's just another thing that they said is that is that what we're heading towards or is there is there something more like why convince me that yeah. this is a skill i need to invest my very you know limited time and energy into sure um think of it this way when you uh hear a story when somebody tells you a story and you really like it you're very likely to tell that story to somebody else. You're going to kind of pass that story. Oh, I heard this great story today about the way Corey lied in his resume to get a job at Jim Henson's, right? And uh, you, you're going to retell that story. And the version of the story that you're going to retell is going to be probably, you're going to get most of the facts and details that I communicated to you. But there's also going to be some gaps that maybe you're going to remember it the way that you remember it. Mm -hmm. The image that played in your head, the the version of the story that I told, the the room that I was in, I didn't describe that well. So you pictured it probably very different than the way that I pictured it. So I think about these as storytelling skills, the ways that we can communicate to somebody else are so that we can help them retell our stories to somebody else. So if I'm selling a product to you and you've got to go for approval to the, the, the department leader or the area manager that's going to have to approve that, they're going to have to retell the story that you told. So yeah. wherever you are in that chain, whether that be from a human resources perspective of this is why we're going to be implementing some change and having a story around it so I can understand it. Now, when I have to tell my direct reports about this, there's something behind it. There's a there's a logic, there's a truth, there's an emotion, there's a credibility that is different than I'm just going to lay down some new rule that everybody's yeah. going to bitch and moan about of like, oh, they're changing it again. You know, I just got used to the last system. People will find a reason to not like change because that's what people do. Yeah. But if we think like storytellers a little bit, think about what is the situation where this justified this or mm -hmm. this motivates that, or in the sales example, this is a why. And I'm helping somebody else to do their job, to sell my product through to their boss to understand what that is. So it's through the repetition. It's through the practice of thinking as a storyteller, thinking in that, that, that frame of what is the story of this. And also let's be really clear about what I think a story is, because there's a lot of use of that word. So let's just kind of find some simple definitions. Like for me, a story can boil down to basically something, a sequence of events in which something is different at the end. It was like this. And at the end, it is different. Something has changed. Something has evolved or changed. That's definition number one for me. The second definition I like to use because I, have come to recognize and realize that things don't always change, but there can still be a story in things that don't change because even if we've gone through something and nothing changed, we can reflect on that. So having a moment of reflection and to look back at the thing and the absence of change can give us insight into an unchanging stasis. So for me, well, especially you're, with your changed, your the, this, you change because you change. of that reflection, right? You change. This this thing happened and nothing changed at the end, but I changed through the experiencing of it, through the understanding of it, through the living yeah. through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think about culture in that 
way of you are acting a certain way and it's not it's not the it's not a hub and spoke so it's not that there's going to be one leader that everybody th this is partially sometimes how this happens like the all hands leader stands up and says x y and z but when we think about the modeling or we think about the behavior it's not a hub and spoke model it's not we're getting all of our information about how culture works about the choices we make from one person, it's through our entire network. Mm -hmm. It's all the different people and the interactions that we have. And so when you're talking about a story that sticks in your head, that makes me remember why this thing has occurred, why this policy has changed, why we're going to sell this piece or we do it this way, you are able to transmit with higher fidelity the 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 symptom of the culture the the way that we choose to do things a little bit more regularly or clearly you're able to yeah. do it in a more and it's going to be able to transmit more so it's almost as if it is a by adding a story to some type of decision pronouncement element you're increasing the power and the reach of that communication at that moment of of you know culture how we do things around here i think so and it doesn't also have to be big you know the stories that affect the cultures of any company can be very private and be very very um localized um like you were saying they don't have to be hub and spoke it doesn't have to be just uh, decreed from on high yeah. but the ways that cultures form inside of companies yeah. that i think when they support the underlying this is our big picture this is our big purpose and something is happening that we didn't even make happen but it's showing that that we live it we walk the walk we talk the talk we do it all that people are doing something on their own so if we are a give back focused organization and without decreeing it demanding it and like forcing employees to do things a group of employees got together to form to do a you know a a, a, a I don't know a bike ride for a specific charity or specific cause, and they're riding for the company. You know they're doing something that re represents the value of the company, mm -hmm. and it's it's their own. It's like it's grown from inside. If your company is creative, and there's some kind of thing where where employees are themselves meeting after hours and creating things together. And then at lunchtime, having a, a mm -hmm. show and tell and showing what mm -hmm. they've made mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the bottom line or the product. What they've done is they've shown we're a creative culture. We do creative things. Look at our own things. Let's yeah. celebrate each other. Those are the kinds of stories also that help to sort of inflate those balloons from from below, from inside the company that make everybody proud to be part of that. So I, I also yeah. really look at that as as culture, you know, um, fertilizer. Yeah, is is thinking about our why, our big picture, and understanding that sometimes we have to let go of control. We can't make yeah. that culture grow. We have to yeah. seed it and see what grows. Yeah. Yeah, um, I would call that an emergent ritual, right? Where and you got to look for those things where they 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 show up, and then you got to support them, or even just get out of the way and let them happen yeah, because they're yeah. so powerful. Um, I think about yeah. the, or I think about the one free, I would say more frequent than other type of story that an organization will tell that is often very powerful is the origin story. Course. Or the founder, right? So yeah. um at HP, right? It's like the story of, you know, Bill in the garage building the first oscillator, or or what I think there's also, you know, there's plenty of garage stories, founding stories, right? But yeah. you have that they they sort of follow the same methodology, right? It's like it was two guys in a garage doing a thing and can't believe it. Or or, you know, Facebook started at Harvard doing a very specific thing, right? Like yeah. That there's a couple different ways of articulating that. Why? I mean, should uh maybe that maybe my question is should every organization at least look at unearthing a uh like an origin story? Is that gonna 
be fertile ground for, you know, like their, their why? I, I hear, I guess I have a complicated response to that one. The other one was, a, was an easy one. This one, I have a more complicated thing. I don't <laughs> think anybody should, should like construct an origin story and again to the credibility tip. If your origin story feels contrived and feels constructed. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Yeah, I don't want to yeah, hear that origin yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, your yeah. story has surprise, has you know, uh, has some something. Con I, I actually heard a great origin story yesterday, and unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the company. So I'm gonna apologize to this company, but they're a company that specializes in data. They're a data sort of harnessing, collecting organization, specifically around. Um, fluid dynamics, right? Like think about wind and the vector of wind, the speed of wind, things like that. They do a lot of their work with um, stadiums, say major league baseball stadiums in which wind is a factor, right? Like you can crush your home run ball, but the wind can knock it back 30 feet. And all of a sudden it's not a home run. Now it's caught on the warning track because of the wind in the stadium. And you probably watched, you know, Major League Baseball games where they're talking about that. Well, the flags are blowing like this. So that means that the ball is likely to go into center field or whatever, that kind of thing. And the origin story of this company is that the founders were, you know, physicists and whatnot. But their son, one of the founder's sons, was a professional baseball player. He made the big leagues. He's playing in Wrigley Field his like first year on the big leagues, you know, he needs studied at Cal or somewhere, but he's, he's in the big leagues. He's standing in center field and he's looking at those, those flags. He's looking at the, at the direction of the wind, but then the ball gets hit and it's not doing what those flags are doing. It's going the other way because wind is not a two dimensional force. It doesn't just go you know, on an X, Y axis, it goes and then it drops and then it crosses and then it swirls. Like there is a dimensionality. There's a fluid dynamic to that. And telling his dad about what he was observing, his father started measuring it. And together they formed a company that specializes in measuring wind for stadiums. So like, that's a pretty cool yeah. origin story because it comes from a person doing a thing that's interesting and observing something about life that is actually interesting. Like how can we measure that? How can we communicate that? And then how could teams use that data? How could stadiums, how could broadcasters, you know, you can think about a lot of different applications of that, yeah. um, that information, but their origin comes from a person doing a thing. Yeah. A person doing a thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is, I think, essentially how we make that uh deliver on that universality yeah like the specific universality of oh i get that like i yeah. feel that i under yeah. i could imagine being that person right i'm we often put ourselves in the hero's position right like yeah of, yeah of, you know it's like oh yeah i could have done that maybe you know totally. false or not but it's like i get it i have empathy for that person i get what that is and Something else that... I like about that particular story too is that yeah. it's not a hero's story. It's the it's the guy in the outfield waiting. For, you know, it's like like the yeah. the you know the you think about your little league experience where you're just bored in the outfield waiting. Well, this yeah. happens in Major League Baseball too, where you're standing out there. You're supposed to be head on the game, but you know what I'm doing? I'm <laughs> looking, <laughs> looking looking around. <laughs> you know. <laughs> picking daisies you know like just like like when's the ball gonna get hit to me and all of a sudden he has a brainstorm that launches a company yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh i love it i love it i love it i love it um well uh cory rosen appreciate you coming on cory rosen is the author of your story well told told so if you want to take home a little bit of cory for yourself i highly recommend the book your story well told um, he's a strategic consultant. You can find him at CoreyRosen.com, C-O-R-E-Y-R-O-S-E-N.com. He can help you become a better storyteller. Um, and he's a great human being, a lot of fun to hang out with. And uh, Corey, thanks for coming to hang out with us on Great Mondays Radio. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Great Mondays. It was a pleasure to be here.